Welcome to Mind Money Balance, the no guilt, no shame podcast to help you get your mind and money in balance. I'm your host, Lindsay. I'm a financial therapist and coach, woman of color, and popcorn connoisseur. I am so glad you're here. Let's go. Hey, Lindsay here on March 18th of 2021 as I record this podcast intro. I'm coming to you today with an introduction that's somber. Again. If you're new here, hello, I'm Lindsay. I'm the host of this podcast, Mind Money Balance. And if you have been here a little while, what I'm about to say might sound a little bit repetitive or maybe new to you. And either way, I don't care. I want you to listen to it. I really need you to. It's it's super, super important. I asked you on February 15th or February 11th, if you follow me on Instagram, to include Asians in your anti-racism work. And I asked you on Instagram, in my emails, on my podcast, on YouTube, <laughs> I, I said, hey, <laughs> We got trouble brewing here. We need some help. And it was mostly met with silence. I think maybe a week or two ago, I heard something on NPR about the increase in anti-Asian racism. PBS did like a five or 10 minute clip the other night about it. And then I woke up yesterday on March 17th to a text from my sister apologizing and another for another brutal hate crime. This time, a little bit more news coverage came of it. So I'm recording this again on March 18th, a day and a half after a mass shooting targeting Asians that resulted in the murder of eight people, six of them who were Asian. And of course, we are not calling this a hate crime. We are saying that the shooter was not racist, because we can't use those words at this point in time. Again, at the time of this recording, some of these things may have changed by the time it comes out on Monday. The person who is in custody has said, yes, I did murder them, but no, I am not a racist. So it's officially easier to say, I murdered people, but I'm not a racist. We have such a hard time coming to terms with race in the United States because it's uncomfortable as fuck. It's hard. And I want to use this moment, this brief snippet of time in this podcast introduction, as a reminder that if you're Asian, Asian American, mixed Asian like me, I see you. The exhaustion is real. The pain is real. The anger is real. The fogginess, the disorientation is real. I vacillate between staring at my computer cursor to napping to being really good at compartmentalizing and powering through and all the reactions to what happened and is happening is valid. And again, here we are. Our relationship with money is varied. My work is intersectional. I've talked about that before back on episode 17 of this podcast. And that means we can't talk about money without addressing mental health or race or class, or gender, or immigration status, or profession, or age, or sexual orientation, or religion, or disability. When any marginalized group is under attack, we are all (laughs) under attack. Our antennas all go up. This is why it's so important to stand in solidarity to not have folks who are in marginalized groups pit themselves against one another and to have our allies really stand up for us. Um, Speaking to you as a person who stands in both spaces, I've got one foot in a world of privilege and I hold a lot of benefits. And as a person who stands with a foot in a marginalized and oppressed group, or groups rather, I can tell you unequivocally, it is easier from an energetic and a mental wealth standpoint, mental wellness, mental wealth, I guess it's the same thing. It's so much easier 
energetically and from a mental wellness standpoint to be an ally and to be an advocate because it's not as charged. It's not as exhausting. Your brain and body isn't shutting down while you're saying, hey, hear me, see me, we matter, I matter. It's so much easier to say this person's voice matters, this person's story matters, this person's life matters than to say, hey, mine mind matters that feels so uncomfortable and painful and exhausting. So if you right now are are able to lean on whatever your privilege is right now, maybe you have racial privilege, religious privilege, gender privilege, whatever it is, please do. We all we all need to kind of toggle if we are able between those two things and rest when we are able. So if you can use your privilege right now, please do. Please use your voice. Please speak up for our, right now I'm calling for help, rallying, allying, amplifying the voices of Asian folks. But that doesn't mean that we only can talk about racism against and toward Asians. It means just right now, this very snapshot in time, that's what I'm asking of you. If you have privilege to help out, please do. Knowing that there will be times if you are in another marginalized or oppressed group that will stand up. We have to help each other out. We have to stand on the shoulders of one another. We have to lean on one another. We have to help each other. Because at the end of the day, like I said a month ago, the enemy here is a system, a system of white supremacy not a person. And to dismantle a system, we need everybody's help. Everybody has a part that they can play. I have a blog post that I made back in January on what to do when you feel helpless. Maybe you're not a social media person. That's totally cool. There are other things you can do. You can get involved with local community organizations. You can shop hyper-local. You can order food from restaurants of folks who are in marginalized communities. There are many, 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 many ways to provide support. And I am incredibly privileged to have this platform to be able to say, hey, let's 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 get to work. Let's do this work. If you have the ability to use your privilege, use it right now. And if you need to rest, please honor that. Please rest. I will be resting today. I will probably be taking extra naps. (laughs) My self-care usually includes nap and uh, garbage TV and snuggling with my dog. (sighs) Big exhale. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And I appreciate if you can share this message, please do. You know, the work that I do is at the intersection of money and mental health. And that's why I'm thrilled to be able to have these conversations with you. And another disclaimer, we will get into my my conversation with today's guest, Nathan Assel, in a second. Just like last week's interview with Dr. Betsy Chung, this interview was recorded back in December of 2020. So just, you know, put on your December 2020 hat while you are listening. And today's guest is an ally. And I think it's important to say, hey, this is an ally. This is an advocate. Thank you for using your voice. Thank you for using your privilege to speak up and speak out against various issues that impact people's social justice. And so I'm really thankful to have him on today. He is a financial therapist. He holds a couples and family therapy master's degree from Kansas State University. And he likes working with couples, talking about financial conflict, financial trauma, and he's fancy. He's, he's been published in academic journals, and he's been on many podcasts and different media outlets really speaking up about the importance of including financial therapy in our mental health and well-being. So with that long introduction, but much needed, thank you. Welcome, Nathan Astell. <music> Hi, Nate. 
welcome to the Mind Money Balance podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so happy to have you here. And for those who don't know who you are, why don't you give us a brief overview of, of who you are professionally, but then also like what you're doing in your downtime for fun, for joy. I'm a board member for the Financial Therapy Association. I, I just finished my master's in couples and family therapy with a focus on financial therapy. And my kind of clinical area is, is largely in couples work um, and couples of financial conflict. But me personally, I'm from a Vegas originally, living in Kansas. My partner and I are, well, we were both in grad school. She's continuing to get her PhD. So she's, she's a smarty pants. Um, and I am, I actually just found out that I got a job, which is really exciting. Yay! Um, yeah, at a community mental health place here in Kansas. So yeah, excited to be here. As far as downtime, I play with my corgi. That's my downtime. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Wow. First of all, congrats to you on finishing up school and kudos to both you and your partner for, for the future endeavors that are coming your way. I'm so curious what led you to financial therapy. It's a relatively new niche in the world of therapy. So how did you end up knowing right away that that's what you wanted to do? I got lucky. When my partner and I were coming out looking at schools, um, I really liked Kansas State's program. It's it's one of the, the best ones in the country for marriage and family therapy. And I just happened when I was got here, I was looking for a job. And one of the places that was open was the Financial Counseling Center here on campus. And I always liked money stuff. I always liked, you know, helping people with money that that felt good to me. But it was really once I got into my therapy program and learned that K-State has a lot of financial therapy resources that I started doing my own money work and like looking like, oh, a big reason why I went into the field I did was uh, because I watched my parents' marriage and how they had conflict and how they worked together. And money was a source of conflict pretty often for them. And it affected me as lot as a kid. And so the more I, I delved into the topic, the more I realized like this is really deep and this is a super needed area. And it felt like something I could potentially contribute to. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. Can you, it sounds like you kind of stumbled upon it quite literally. And then it, all these light bulbs just kind of went off that this was a good fit for you. To the extent that you're comfortable, can you share with us a little bit about your money story? Yeah. Well, like I said, my, my parents, and this is the, I guess the one scenario, my money story is a long one, but uh, when I was about 11 or so, you know, I come from a middle, middle to upper class family. So I, I never felt like I was in want with money related things. I always had food. I never felt not safe or anything like that. But I do remember when I was 11, my dad bought a four-wheeler, a quad, and that was really cool for me, 11-year-old. So I was like, cool, this new toy. But he didn't tell my mom about it. And understandably, she was very upset because, you know, it's a fairly large purchase, um, four to $5,000, and she wasn't consulted with it. And so, you know, they had a, quite a bit of conflict about it. They're arguing, yelling. Sometimes it was angry outbursts. Sometimes it was more just passive aggressive comments, but it was a significant source of distress in my home. And I'm over here, just, you know, the 11 year old kid loving this new toy. I'm like, cool, this is so fun. But I also kind of internalized some of the conflict that they were having. Like, gosh, is me enjoying this toy somehow making things worse for them? And that was a really impactful moment because that scared me about money. Like money scared me from then on because it was a problem maker. And that kind of carried on, you know, when my partner and I got married and got together about about five years ago, I think there's also some gender socialization because I'm a, I identify as male and I grew up in a very male centric household and, and environment I was expected to know a lot about money and I was expected to take care of all the finances and that's the man's role. And so, you know, my partner and I are trying to beat off some of these 
you know, socializations. But when we first got married, it was, I was still scared. And I think I have extra pressure, not from my partner, more just from society and from inside myself that said, you're supposed to tackle this. But it was really intimidating. And it wasn't until my partner and I really sat down and talked through all this stuff did I realize that, oh, I don't have to do this all by myself. And uh, it was big. You know, it, it sounds simple, but it was a really big deal for our relationship and for me personally. Yeah. And I mean, as you know, it isn't simple, right? <laughs> Money is, is inherently complicated, emotional. There are stories that we have associated with money, like you said, not just within our families, but from a cultural perspective as well. And I appreciate you bringing up a few things. One is just privilege doesn't protect you from money being a potential source of contention, right? So in my work as a financial therapist, so many people immediately think that my clients must be struggling with like a chronic lack of income or chronic debt. And I'm like, sure, that could be, but the bulk of my clients actually bring in good money and struggle with how do I communicate with my partner about it? What does it mean to be a person who has money? So there are so much more complications. There are many more complications and so much more nuance to our relationship with money. So first, thank you for pointing that out. And also for pointing out the ways in which people who are raised as men in our country slash North America, really, you and I are both in the US, but so many men are, are kind of told they should just inherently know what to do with money and research you know, as recent as 2017 has pointed out that we socialize boys and girls differently when it comes to money. We teach little girls how to save money and we teach little boys how to earn money and and we talk to them about taking risks. So I appreciate you sharing that aspect of it. And I find it a lot of my client work for folks who are socialized as men, the shame that comes with how did I not know how to do X, Y, or Z? Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Where would you say you are now in your relationship with money? I don't think there's an end point for most things in life. Um, and I'm still working through it, honestly. Um, so I, I recently graduated, uh, which I'm really excited about, really proud of. But it's also a time where I could be making significantly more money than I ever did as a grad student. You know, as a grad student, I was making $10,000 a year and my partner as well. And so that's grateful that we had something, but it's really not a whole lot. And so now I'm in a position where I'm, you know, I, I found employment, but also some side jobs and thing that additional income that is multiple times what I used to be paid and it was really interesting because, you know, this is my area. This is what I help people do. This is what I've researched. This is who I talk to all day. I'm on podcasts with financial therapists. But even in myself, I noticed that, like, what does it mean for me to be making more money and, and being aware of my privilege as, you know, as a white male? Like, does me making more money in coaching contexts, you know, how does that take away from people that might need financial therapy, but don't have access to it. All these sorts of things are going on in my head. And what I kind of realized was a lot of my own fear and money avoidance, which I've had for a long time, it's still there. And I think I've come a long way as far as identifying, identifying it myself. I'm still struggling to make my financial behaviors match up with my, you know, actual values, especially in COVID. Like, with the stress of COVID and retail therapy, like that's a real thing. And sometimes it's nice to get a package, but then it's not necessarily what's helpful for your bank account. So my point is, is I'm still in a journey, but I think, but I think just acknowledging that I'm not there yet helps me at least keeps me open and on my toes. Yeah. And I I think that's so true that money, just like our relationship with ourselves and with our partners is evolving and ongoing. Our relationship with money is also evolving and ongoing. So I appreciate your insight to say, look, it's gotten better for sure. And there's still work to do in acknowledging that there will almost always be new things that happen in our lives that kind of press on different pain points in us that make us go, oh shoot, I guess I still have more work to do in this area. And also just the humanness of, yes, I know logically that maybe I shouldn't be shopping 
more right now in COVID, but the emotional side of like, man, I could really use a little hit of dopamine without Mm -hmm. the, you know, we're, we're not hugging people. We're not holding people. We're not in space, sharing space with other people and we're social human beings. So finding different ways to get that dopamine hit, maybe it's not ideal, but it's also like we're human. What are things that have helped you as you cultivate a healthy relationship with money? Is it tools? Is it podcasts? Is it being in school? What were some of the more helpful things maybe as you kind of got started on this journey? The single biggest and my own biases and viewpoints on therapy come out here, but single biggest resource I have is my relationship with my partner. And, you know, she and I share money and our financial lives are tied in a lot of ways, but being creating the safe place in our relationship to talk about money, which is a big deal, has been hugely impactful when I start actually tackling money shame or money avoidance. Being able to come to Shel- Shelby's my partner's name, um, being able to come to Shelby and say, "Hey, this is like really hard," and or you know we're you know, we're looking at a budget or whatever it is. And I can say to her, I'm starting to feel really overwhelmed looking at this. Um, is it okay if we take like a two minute break and she'll, we'll take her break, but you know, she'll sit there and hold my hand or whatever in and, and hug me and those things. And those are really reassuring for me, but having a good relationship with an other person that you can rely on as support especially if it's a romantic partner that you're also sharing finances with is hugely impactful when it comes to actually tackling the money issue itself. It's like, okay, I have someone in my corner and I have someone that like it's me and them versus the problem. It's not just me and it's not, I don't, I have resources. What I think is really interesting about that response is that so many people feel like when it comes to money and they're in a romantic partnership, they have to figure their own stuff out first. And what I heard you say was actually doing it alongside somebody was helpful. Why do you think that was the case of, you know, you didn't want to just like do it yourself and then bring it to Shelby, you and Shelby worked in partnership. This also kind of just how I think is like a systems thinker of thinking how I affect another person and they affect me. There were certain things that I can't put on Shelby. I can't expect Shelby to like heal my financial trauma or anything, but it's, it's a little cliche Two heads are better than one. Like those systemic resources, whether it's a romantic partner, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's and more macro systems, whether it's employment or government agencies, whatever it is, the more help and more people you can get in your corner, the easier it's going to be to tackle this. And I absolutely believe that money requires a team. And so it's potentially, that not everybody may need this, but potentially a financial therapist, a financial planner, a financial counselor. And obviously not everyone can afford all that. I get it. But the more people you can have that can be supporting you, the more likely you are going to be able to follow through because it's not just relying on self. It's not pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. That's not how people work. And so, yeah, it's her helping me, but it's also me helping her. And then we feel like a team and it's, it's more than the sum of its parts. Yes. Beautifully said. Yeah. Two ads are better than one. And, and that's why I love, I love doing couples work, but I also love doing group work because so much of money work is, is undoing the shame, is undoing the lessons that we've learned and to have other people in that space validate kind of what you've experienced can help so much with freeing yourself from that burden of, I should have known this, or I should have done this. So I I do appreciate that insight. I'm curious, like having, when I was in school, grad school over a decade ago, we did not talk about money in my grad program. The only time we talked about money in my grad program was like, a blip. It was in a death and dying class when we talked about it within the context of durable power of attorneys. So it was like very much off limits. It was, we were told to refer out if anything came our way. So I had to seek out my own additional training because this was of, of interest to me. 
did you notice a difference between like the two worlds of marriage and family therapy and financial therapy, or did you feel like they were pretty blended by the time you were in grad school? Hmm. I didn't ever take a class on money or anything in my MFT program. So I think that remains the same. And and there's some research that, you know, our experience is very um, it's normal. But Dr. Britt Luter, for example, has done some work on how counseling programs don't get training in money, in money issues, not only in their clients, but in themselves, right? So I, I think, you know, financial therapy is a field. There's been different blips of it over time. I think when it all really came together, it was about, you know, 10 years ago, it's fairly new, but there were a lot of marriage and family therapy influences there at that first meeting. So I think, I think the worlds can mesh. I think it's just doing it. I think programs do need to be having these conversations about money and have it just be as much as they do, like self of the therapist work, have it be self of the financial therapist work, even if they don't plan on doing money a whole lot, having them address their own beliefs around money is going to be super helpful, just the same way that they encourage people to work out their own trauma stuff, or work out their own sex stuff, because they come up, it comes up, people experience trauma, people experience problems with sex, and people experience problems with money. And so it's really important that therapists are prepared within themselves to have those conversations. I'm curious if you ever got feedback from your marriage and family therapist cohort or or classmates who weren't in the financial therapy track, anything along the lines of like, oh, I could never right? Like when I tell people that I'm a financial therapist, I usually get one of two responses. I usually get, oh, cool. Wait, what is that? Like people have no clue or, oh my gosh, I couldn't imagine talking to people about money. Like being a therapist is hard enough. I'm curious what, like what the response was to folks who were not financial therapists or on that track, how they responded to you getting that training. It definitely was a lot of the, oh, I could never, I think it kind of became like an identity. It was like, he's the finances guy. And that's, I like it. Okay, cool. I'll be the finance guy. But I am also a little disappointed. I love my core and I have a great relationship with him. But I'm a little disappointed that as a field, we haven't leaned into this more, that there isn't the same energy that we have towards, you know, sex or trauma or, you know, whatever topic because this is so important and it affects everybody. Like, you know, it's, it's a requirement to take, you know, things on culture, right? Because culture is everywhere and you cannot escape in every single one of your clients. Money is absolutely tied to that. And no matter whether it's a wealthy or not so wealthy, whether they're, they have a romantic partner or not, whatever their presenting problem is, money is shaping that experience. And it's really important that therapists get formal training, but also just do some personal work in the area. Okay. So that leads me into a question that I can imagine listeners asking. For listeners who are therapists, who have not heard of financial therapy or who aren't trained in financial therapy, and here you are, Nate, saying like, go get some training on that. Where the hell do we turn? Where do we go? (laughs) Yeah, uh, it's a good question. And honestly, it's okay if you don't know, because there hasn't been a lot. Um, You know, there's been some books, you know, Brad Klontz has done some work with me Mind Over Money, but there hasn't been like formal training. So it's okay if you don't uh, know. Um, The Financial Therapy Association does offer a video series, an education video series, and it covers 10 different topics about It does have some things about like financial therapy itself, but also has topics on like red flag issues, um, money and relationships, self of the financial therapist. I would imagine that most therapists who have done CEs or done training in, you know, at different models of therapy, whatever it is, I think it'd be pretty easy to see the parallel of doing your own work. And there's things like, you know, we use like genograms with clients. There's like a money genogram that you can look at or a money timeline, just, you know, highlighting highs and lows of your experience. There's lots of tools out there. I would suggest checking out the Financial Therapy Association. It is a centralized place where you can find a lot of those tools. 
of course, you can reach out to Lindsay or me and, you know, help, happy to help. But yeah, I would start with the FTA. That would be a good place to start. Great. Thank you for that insight. Any other words of wisdom you would offer to maybe non-therapists who are listening, who are considering getting started on, on maybe dipping their toe in the world of getting working towards a healthier relationship with money? The biggest thing I think is be, be kind and be compassionate to yourself. Like I said earlier, like this is like my, my whole job and, and kind of professional identity revolves around financial therapy and I'm yet still a work in progress. And I, I would assume Lindsay, you would, you would agree for yourself. Like, a thousand percent. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's okay not to be where you want to be right now. There are things happening in the world and things happening in your life, both past and present that affect your relationship with money at your pace and on your time. You know, I, I'd encourage bravery and courage to step into something that might be more uncomfortable and compassion for where you've been and where you are now. It's hard work. It really, really is. And sometimes you don't always expect it to be quite as hard as it might actually end up being. And that's okay. I want to be a word of kindness and compassion to yourself and, and being intentional about being compassionate, making sure that you are expressing compassion to yourself and to your partner if they are having troubles with finances. So I, I know that's reductionistic, but you know, as much as you can, just allow yourself to be on a journey. And I think that's a great takeaway. Again and again, what I hear from people is give yourself grace, give yourself compassion. We aren't taught this. Well, let me take that back. We are very rarely taught anything about this when it comes to both the tangibles, the financial literacy, but also the emotional side, which is you know what we've been talking about today. So I, I really appreciate your insight just to, to give ourselves credit for where we've been and where we're going and that you know, it is a journey and there's people available to help. There are organizations available to help. So yeah, I appreciate that insight. And Nate, if people are interested in connecting with you or getting to know you off of the podcast, where should they go? Uh, yeah, two biggest places are probably Twitter or LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, you can just search Nathan Astle, A-S-T-L-E. Mm -hmm. And on Twitter, I think my Twitter handle is like Nate underscore Astle. Great. Those will be linked in the show notes. So for folks who are interested in connecting with Nate, you can tweet at him or you can reach out over to him to him over on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for your time and, and sharing with us some insight like straight from the uh, walking down the graduate aisle, I suppose. What is that called? <laughs> I can't even think of the words, but yay. Thank you for offering that insight. So, super helpful. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Of course. Right before we get into the takeaways, I realized after I recorded the intro that I wanted to give you some other to-dos if you didn't have enough already after I was asking for your help and advocacy, allyship and solidarity. I will link a bunch of different resources if you want to contribute financially to the cause of stopping hate against Asian American Pacific Islanders, there will be a bunch of different options for you to check out and donate if you feel so inclined. I am not associated with or affiliated with any of them, but I do think that oftentimes, you know, money makes a difference, right? I wouldn't have this podcast, I wouldn't be saying everything I'm saying if I didn't believe that there was validity in putting your money where your mouth is. So yeah, be sure if you are listening on the go afterwards to tap on the link to take you to the show notes and there will be a bunch of different options there. With that, the takeaways from my chat with Nathan are number one, just to be nice, right? <laughs> to practice some empathy and compassion. He was talking about practicing some compassion and empathy for 
where he was and where he was going. And we know that this self-empathy, this self-compassion, and he also shared with his romantic partner how important that was. But having that empathy and compassion helps to relieve money shame and money anxiety. We all have those moments where we feel like we should have done X with money or we should have done Y with money. And those shoulds are often layered with shame. So if we can practice a little bit of kindness and a little bit of compassion for the journey that we've been on with our money, that is going to help. Which brings me to takeaway number two, that there's no end point in money. You can't just check off of your list. I dealt with my money shit all done. The end. I hate to break it to you, but money is something that you will continue to engage with throughout your life. So there's no end point in your relationship with money. It ebbs and flows. If you, you know, have fear and money avoidance and you don't really have behaviors that match up with facing that fear and avoidance, you're going to feel a little bit stuck. So face that fear or face that avoidance unpack what it means for you and work through it and know that as you work through it, or maybe you work all the way through it, even though it's a little contradictory, as I just said, there's no end point in our relationship with money. Know that something new might come up, right? You might be in a good place financially. You might be in a good place with your relationship with money. And then there's a change in your life. You get a new job. Your partner loses their job. You you know, find out you didn't get that raise at work or you thought your student loans would be paid off and they you no longer qualify for student loan forgiveness, right? There are different things that can happen in our life where all of a sudden we go, oh shoot, I have more work to do. And that's okay. It is absolutely a journey when we talk about having a relationship with money. And then the third takeaway is having someone on your team to talk money stuff with, right? So Nathan was talking about how one of the biggest things that helped him to cultivate a healthy ongoing relationship with his money Money, was being able to talk to his partner about it. Does it help that his partner is also a, a helper healer professional? Sure. But does it mean that you can't do it if you aren't in this field or your partner's not in the field? No, of course not. Let me just remind you really quickly that money is often one of the leading causes of divorce or separation. It always, not always, it almost always ties with infidelity as being the number one or number two cited reason of divorce in the U.S. Depends on the year, depends on the study, but it's always kind of battling there for, for the number one reason that people aren't able to make their relationships work. But on the flip side of that, we know research also shows that people, couples who talk about money regularly, they have healthier relationships than couples who do not talk about money. So not talking about money is incredibly detrimental to your relationship, whereas talking about money actually strengthens your relationship. So it is so, so important to talk about money, even if you bumble over it, even if you stumble over it, it's all good. Having that conversation is helpful. And if you need help, of course, you can seek out a financial therapist, a couples therapist, a money coach. Seek out somebody else who can help to hold space for the two of you as you talk about money, which also leads me into another thing. This is not a takeaway, (laughs) but I am getting ready to welcome the third cohort of private practice therapists into my group coaching program, Grow a Profitable Practice from the Inside Out. To get details and get on the wait list for some wait list goodies, head to my website, mindmoneybalance.com slash profitable practice. That's all one word. Again, that's mindmoneybalance.com slash profitable practice. Add your name to the wait list and you will get some extra bonuses and goodies for being an early bird person if you are interested. All the details are there. And with that, I will see you next week. And again, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for holding space for me. Thank you for showing up, listening to this podcast, sharing it out with people, telling people that it exists. Your support means everything. Thank you. If you love this episode, take a screenshot and tag me on Instagram at Mind Money Balance with your favorite takeaway. I love seeing what resonates with my listeners and sharing it in my stories. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'll see you next week right here. Neither the host or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, medical, or other professional information. If you want professional help, please seek it out.